Hi students, today I'm going to discuss to you the idealized Brayton cycle. What is an ideal Brayton cycle? The ideal Brayton cycle was introduced by George Brayton, a mechanical engineer who has been known for his invention on a constant pressure engine. The ideal Brayton cycle is an idealized cycle for gas turbine which is commonly used in electric power generation, industrial applications such as in oil and gas processing, and in transportation systems such as locomotive, marine, jet propulsion, and among many others. An ideal Brayton cycle is composed of two reversible adiabatic processes, which occurs in the compressor and in the turbine, and two isobaric processes, which occurs in the combustion chamber and in its sink. But before we proceed with the discussion on the ideal Brayton cycle, I'm going to give you a trivia question. And the trivia question is, what thermodynamic cycle has exactly the same thermodynamic processes as Brayton cycle? To continue with our discussion about the idealized Brayton cycle, I'm going to discuss the components of the ideal Brayton cycle. Brayton cycle mainly co composed of three major components. These are the compressor, which actually used to provide sufficient amount of air in the cycle, where the compression of the air from process 1 to 2 occurs. And then it will go through the combustion chamber, where a certain amount of fuel is added to provide heat. And then the hot gas will go through the turbine, okay, which is used to convert thermal energy to rotary motion, which is what we know as the mechanical energy. And by the second law of thermodynamics, as we all know, that all, all the heat added to the system can be converted into work some has to be rejected and that is why a certain amount of flue gas has to leave the gas turbine with certain temperature and pressure in an ideal Brayton cycle we can see that the shaft of the turbine and the shaft of the compressor are interconnected it means that the work that is used to run the compressor is actually taken from the work generated in the turbine In the analysis of the Brayton cycle, two of the most important tools that we use is the PB and the TS diagram. So this is how the PB and TS diagram of an ideal Brayton cycle looks like. As we all know, process 1 to 2 is a reversible adiabatic process or commonly known as the isentropic process. So this is where the air is compressed inside the compressor. And then process 2 to 3 is an isobaric heat addition process in the combustion chamber. And then process 3 to 4 is the reversible adiabatic expansion inside the turbine where the work or the power is generated. And then process 4 to 1 is the isobaric heat rejection process. Heat rejection normally occurs in an ideal Brayton cycle in heat sink, which is actually the atmosphere or the environment. As we all know, the PB diagram shows the work that is involved in the cycle, while the TS diagram shows the heat that is involved in the cycle. Let us now proceed to the detailed analysis of an idealized Brayton cycle. An idealized Brayton cycle starts with the compression process that is 1 to 2. In an ideal cycle, compression process is done in reversible adiabatic process. Reversible adiabatic process is also known as isentropic process in which we can simply say that the entropy at point 1 is equal to the entropy at point 2. Thermodynamically, we can also say that the product of the pressure times the volume raised to the specific heat ratio is equals to constant C. Or we can simply say that 
pressure at point 1 times the volume at point 1 raised to k is equals to pressure at point 2 times the volume at point 2 raised to k. Then, we can simply say that the volume is equal to the constant C all over P raised to 1 over K. One of the significant parameters that we have to determine in dealing with an idealized Brayton cycle is the pressure ratio. The pressure ratio is simply the ratio between the pressure at the end of the compression process all over the pressure at the beginning of the compression process. As we all know, in the compression process, pressure increases. Then, we can simply say that the pressure ratio should be greater than 1. Another important relationship that we can derive from an isentropic process is the relationship between the temperature and the pressure. We can, we can simply say that the ratio between the temperature at point 2 all over the temperature at point 1 is equal to the pressure at point 2 all over the pressure at point 1 raised to k minus 1 over k. And then substituting the value of the ratio between the pressure at point 2 all over the pressure at point 1 which is equal to Rp, then we can simply say that T2 all over T1 is also equal to Rp raised to k minus 1 over k. And then the relationship between the volume and the pressure, we have the volume at point 1 all over the volume at point 2 is equals to the pressure at point 2 all over the pressure at point 1 raised to 1 over k. Or simply, that is equals to the pressure ratio raised to 1 over k. Take note that k is called specific heat ratio. That is the ratio between the specific heat capacity at constant pressure process all over the specific heat capacity at constant volume process. In order to determine the amount of work that should be supplied in the compressor, we have to determine the work of the compression. Applying the, neg the steady flow work equation, which is equal to the negative integral of the volume times the differential pressure, we can simply say that the work of the compression is equal to the volume times the differential pressure from point 1 to point 2. And then applying the value of V, which is equal to C all over P raised to 1 over K, we can simply say that the work of the compression is equal to negative C raised to 1 over K times the integral from point 1 to point 2 of P raised to negative 1 over K dP. And applying the rules of integration, we can simply say that the work of the compression is equal to the negative C raised to 1 over K times P2 raised to negative 1 over K plus 1 minus C raised to 1 over K times P1 raised to negative 1 over K plus 1 all over negative 1 over K plus 1. Substituting the value of C raised to 1 over K which is equals to V2 times P2 raised to 1 over K times P2 raised to negative 1 over K plus 1 minus another value of C raised to 1 over K is B1 times P1 raised to 1 over K times P1 raised to negative 1 over K plus 1 all over negative 1 over K plus 1 in which we can rewrite it into K minus 1 all over K. Applying the rules of exponent, we can simplify the equation for the compressor, compressor work which is equals to negative K times the product of the pressure at point 2 times the volume at point 2 minus the product of the pressure at point 1 times the volume at point 1 all over k minus 1. In thermodynamics, the product of the pressure times the volume is equal to the product of the mass times the specific gas constant times the absolute temperature. Therefore, we can simply say that P2B2 is equal to MRT2 and P1B1 is equal to MRT1. Substituting the value to the equation, work of the compressor is equal to negative K times MRT2 minus MRT1 over K minus 1. Factoring out the common terms which are MR, work of the compression is equal to negative MRK times T2 minus T1 over K minus 1. In ideal gas equation, a specific heat capacity at constant pressure process is also equal to the universal 
the specific gas constant rather times k all over k minus 1. Then, substituting the value to the equation, work of the compressor is equals to negative m times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure process times T2 minus T1. Now, since T2 is greater than T1, work of the compression is negative. In thermodynamics, a negative work signifies work is done to the system. It means that the work should be done to the compressor, that is by applying electrical energy in order for the compressor to work. Next is process 2 to 3, which is an isobaric heat addition process in the combustion chamber. Isobaric process is also known as constant pressure process. Then, we can simply say that the pressure at point 2 is equal to the pressure at point 3. Another relationship that we can derive from an isobaric process is the ratio between the volume and the temperature is constant. It means that the ratio between the volume at point 2 all over the temperature point at point 2 is equal to the volume at point 3 all over the temperature at point 3. In order to determine the amount of heat added in the system, in an isobaric process, Q is equal to delta H. Or, in the case of an idealized Brayton cycle, Q is equal to the integral of the differential enthalpy from point 2 to point 3. As we all know, enthalpy is equal to mass times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure times the temperature. Applying the limit, we have heat added is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure process times the temperature difference between point 3 and point 2. Next is process 3 to 4, which is actually the generation of work in the turbine. The generation of work in the turbine is ideally done in a reversible adiabatic expansion process. Similar to process 1 to 2, reversible adiabatic process is also known as isentropic process. Then, we can simply say that the entropy at point 3 is equal to the entropy at point 4. Similarly, we can also say that the product of the pressure times the volume raised to specific heat ratio is constant. Or, it means that P3 times B3 raised to K is equal to P4 times B4 raised to K. The temperature and pressure relationship is P3 all over T4 is equal to P3 all over P4 raised to K minus 1 over K. Take note, the temperature 3 is the maximum temperature. Now, in an, in an idealized cycle, since process 2 to 3 is an isobaric process, it means that pressure at point 3 is equal to pressure at point 2. Similarly, process 4 to 1 is an isobaric process. It means that the pressure at point 4 is equal to the pressure at point 1. And then substituting the value, we have T3 all over T4 is equal to P2 all over P1 raised to K minus 1 over K. As we all know, P2 over P1 is called the pressure ratio. So T3 all over T4 is also equal to the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K. Similarly, B4 over B3 is equal to P3 all over P4 raised to 1 over K. Or that is also equal to the ratio between the pressure at point 2 all over the pressure at point 1 raised to 1 over K which is also equal to the pressure ratio raised to 1 over K. It means that the volume at point 4 is greater than the volume at point 3. In order to determine the amount of work generated in the turbine, we can also apply the steady flow work equation, which is equal to the negative integral of the volume times the differential pressure. Applying same process from process 1 to 2, work of the turbine can be Simplified to mass times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure times the temperature difference between T3 minus T4. In order to determine the net cycle work, the net cycle work is just simply the sum of the turbine work plus the compressor work. Take note that the compressor work is negative 
while the turbine work is positive. And based from our previous equation, work of the turbine is equals to M times Cp times T3 minus T4 plus the work of the compression is negative M times Cp times T2 minus T1. Based from the previous relationship, we all know that T3 is equals to T4 times the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K. And T2 is also equal to T1 times the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K. Substituting the value to the equation above, we can simply say that the work net is equals to MCP times T4 times the quantity of the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K minus 1 minus MCP T1 times the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K minus 1. Factoring out the common term which is RP raised to K minus 1 over K minus 1, we can simplify the formula for the net cycle work is equals to the mass times CP times RP raised to K minus 1 over K minus 1 multiplied by T4 minus T1. In order to determine the cycle thermal efficiency, which is the ratio between the useful work all over the heat added, in the case of an idealized Brayton cycle, useful work is known as the net cycle work. So the cycle thermal efficiency is equals to the net cycle work all over the heat added. And based from the previous equation, where the net cycle work is equals to M Cp times Rp raised to K minus 1 over K minus 1, times T4 minus T1 all over the heat added based from the previous equation which is equals to M Cp times T3 minus T2. As we all know, T3 is equals to T4 times Rp raised to K minus 1 over K and T2 is equals to T1 times Rp raised to K minus 1 over K. Substituting these values to the next equation, we have the cycle thermal efficiency is equals to Rp raised to k minus 1 over k minus 1 times t4 minus t1 all over t4 times rp raised to k minus 1 over k minus t1 times rp raised to k minus 1 over k. Take note that we already cancelled out the product of the mass times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure. And then simplifying the common term in the denominator which is rp raised to k minus 1 over k, the net cycle work can be written as Rp raised to k minus 1 over k minus 1 times t4 minus t1 all over Rp raised to k minus 1 over k times t4 minus t1. Since t4 minus t1 is common in both the numerator and denominator, we can simplify the cycle thermal efficiency into Rp raised to k minus 1 over k minus 1 over Rp raised to k minus 1 over k. Algebraically, we can also rewrite this equation into 1 minus 1 all over the pressure ratio raised to k minus 1 over k. In this equation, we can say that in order to increase the cycle thermal efficiency, we have to increase the pressure ratio. Or, we can simply say that the higher the pressure ratio, the higher the cycle thermal efficiency. Take note that my discussion is limited to an idealized Brayton cycle. In an idealized Brayton cycle, we consider all the system is 100% efficient, including the compressor, the combustion chamber, and the turbine. However, in an actual Brayton cycle, we consider the irreversibility in the compressor. It means that there is a loss of work in the compressor, or we can simply say that the actual work needed in the compressor is greater than the theoretical work computed. Another, in an actual Brayton cycle, we also have to consider the heat loss in the combustion chamber. As we all know, a combustion chamber is not 100% efficient. There's a tendency that the, the combustion chamber itself will absorb some amount of heat. Then, we can simply say that the actual heat added in the combustion chamber should be greater than the theoretical or ideal heat that should be added into the gas. Another is the reversibility in the turbine. Again, 
turbine is not 100% efficient, it means that it will not be able to convert all the potential amount of work into useful work. It means that the actual turbine work is less than the theoretical turbine work that is due to the design of the blades which are not 100% efficient. However, in order to improve the efficiency or the performance of an idealized cycle, there are several ways that can be applied. First is the intercooling, especially if we use a multi-stage compression process. Next is the reheating, especially when we apply it to a multi-stage turbine process and the regeneration process. So let us now proceed to an example of an idealized Brayton cycle. Say we have this problem. In an ideal Brayton cycle, the air enters the compressor at the rate of 2 kg per second with a temperature and pressure of 27 degrees Celsius and 101 kPa. So the pressure ratio in the compressor is 10 and the maximum cycle temperature is 800 degrees Celsius. Determine the following. First, the cycle state points, pressure, volume, and absolute temperature. Second, compressor work. Third, heat added in the combustion chamber. Fourth, turbine work. Fifth is cycle thermal efficiency. Given this schematic diagram, at point 1, we are given the mass flow rate of air, which is equal to 2 kg per second, the initial temperature, which is 27 degrees Celsius, and the initial pressure, which is 101 kPa. The maximum cycle temperature given is 800 degrees Celsius. Take note that the maximum temperature is temperature at point 3. Starting at point 1, Based from the given, we have P1 equals to 101 kPa. Take note that the temperature must always be absolute. So therefore, converting 27 degrees Celsius to absolute temperature, we can say that T1 is equal to 300 Kelvin. Now, since we're given a mass flow rate, we can now solve for the volume flow rate using ideal gas equation, which is equals to the product of the pressure times the volume is equals to the product of the mass times the specific gas constant times T. Or we can simply say that the volume flow rate at point 1 is equals to the mass flow rate times the specific gas constant times the absolute temperature at point 1 all over the pressure at point 1. Substituting the values, it will give us a result of volume flow rate at point 1 is equals to 1.705 cubic meter per second. Then at point 2, we're given a pressure ratio in the, compression, in the compressor which is equal to 10. Using the previous relationship that we derived, we can simply say that the pressure at point 2 is equal to the pressure at point 1 times the pressure ratio. Substituting the value, we have the pressure at point 2 is 1010 kilopascal. Similarly, using the previous equations that we have in process 1 to 2, we can solve for the temperature at point 2, which is equal to the absolute temperature at point 1 times the pressure ratio raised to k minus 1 over k. And then substituting the value, we have the temperature at point 2 is equal to 579.21 Kelvin. And then the volume at point 2, Volume flow rate at point 2 is equal to the volume flow rate at point 1 all over Rp raised to 1 over K. That is derived from process 1 to 2 on the, pre on the, on the previous slides. So the volume flow rate at point 2 is equal to 0.329 cubic meter per second. Then proceed at point 3. Take note. That process 2 to 3 is isobaric process. It means that the pressure at point 3 is equal to the pressure at point 2. And then we are we have given a maximum temperature which is 800 degrees Celsius 
or that is equals to 1073 Kelvin ab in absolute unit. And then, using isobaric process, we have volume flow rate at point 3 all over the te absolute temperature at point 3 should be equal to the volume flow rate at point 2 all over the absolute temperature at point 2 or we can simply say that the volume flow rate at point 3 is equal to the volume flow rate at point 2 times the absolute temperature at point 3 all over the absolute temperature at point 2. And then substituting the value, the volume flow rate at point 3 is equal to 0 0.609 cubic meter per second. At point 4, pressure ratio is equal to 10 since the pressure ratio in the compressor is equal to the pressure ratio in the turbine based on an idealized rate and cycle. Also, we all know that process 4 to 1 is an isobaric process. So we can simply say that the pressure at point 4 is equal to the pressure at point 1. Similarly, to solve for T4, we can use formula. The maximum temperature T3 all over the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K. And substituting the value, T4 is equals to 555.76 Kelvin. And to solve for B4, we can use the formula B3 times RP raised to 1 over K. And substituting the value, B4 is equals to 3.154 cubic meter per second. As you can see, based on the PB diagram, the maximum volume is at 0.4. Now, solving for the ideal compressor work using the formula that we have derived a while ago. So the compressor work is equals to the negative M times the specific heat capacity at constant pressure times the temperature difference between 0.2 and 0.1. Substituting the value, work of the compressor is equals to 558.42 kilowatts. That's negative 558.42 kilowatts. Or the work that should be applied in the compressor is about 558.42 kilowatts. To solve for the heat added, the heat added is equals to MCP times T3 minus T2. And then substituting the value, it will give us a value of heat added is equals to 987.58 kilowatts. Solving for the ideal turbine work, okay. the formula is equals to MCP times T3 minus T4. And then substituting the value, it will give us an AD, uh, a value of theoretical work is equals to 1034.48 kilowatts. So for the net cycle work, as you all know, net cycle work should have been equal to the turbine work plus the compressor work. Since the compressor work is negative, we can also say that the net cycle work is equals to the positive turbine work plus the negative work of the compressor or the positive turbine work minus the work of the compressor. So we were able to solve for the turbine work which is actually equal to 1034.48 kilowatts while the compressor work is 558.42 kilowatts. Getting the difference will lead us to a net cycle work of 476.06 kilowatts. For the cycle thermal efficiency, as we all know, the cycle thermal efficiency is simply the ratio between the useful work all over the heat added. In the case, again, of an idealized Brayton cycle, we all know that the useful work is actually the net cycle work. So, the net cycle work is equal to 476.06 kilowatts while the heat added is equal to 987.58 kilowatts. So it will give us a cycle efficiency of 0.4820 or 48.20%. To check whether we were able to solve for the correct value, we can also use other formula for the cycle thermal efficiency which is equal to 1 minus 1 all over the pressure ratio raised to K minus 1 over K. And we have given a pressure ratio of 10. So substituting the value, it will give us a cycle thermal efficiency of 0.4820 or 
48.20%. It means that whether we use the first formula or we use the second formula, we should come up with the same answer. Summarizing all the values that we solve, okay. at point 1, okay, we have P1 equals to 100 Watt kilopascal. Our temperature 1 is 300 Kelvin. Our volume 1 is 1.705 cubic meter per second. And then after passing through the compressor, we all know that the volume should have been decreased. So the volume flow rate at point 2 is 0.329 cubic meter per second, which is smaller than the initial volume, while the pressure at point 2 should be higher than the pressure at point 1. And the pressure at point 2 is equal to 1,010 kilopascal, while the temperature at point 2 is equal to 579.21 Kelvin, which is higher than the initial temperature. Now, at point 3, our pressure at point 3 is actually equal to the pressure at point 2, which is 1,010 kilopascal, since as we all know, process 2 to 3 is an isobaric heat addition process. While the volume at volume flow rate at point 3 is 0 0.609 cubic meter per second, it is a natural tendency that whenever you add heat to the system, there must be an increase in temperature, thus it will expand. So therefore, the volume flow rate at point 3 should be higher than the volume flow rate at point 2. And we have a maximum absolute temperature, T3, which is, is equal to 1,073 Kelvin. Now, at point 4, we have pressure at point 4 is equal to the pressure at point 1, which is 101 kilopascal. And we have at an absolute temperature at point 4 of 555.76 Kelvin, which should have been lower than T3. And solving for B4, we came up with a value of 3.154 cubic meter per second and it's quite obvious from the PB diagram that the volume at point 4 is the largest volume. To summarize, we all know that the PB diagram shows the work involved in the process. So the work of the compressor is 558.42 kilowatts while the work of the turbine is equal to 1034.48 kilowatt. It means that the total amount of power needed to run the compressor is smaller than the ideal turbine work. For the TS diagram, as you all know, the TS diagram is used to show the heat involved in the process. So the heat added is equal to 987.58 kilowatts, while the heat rejected is 511.52 kilowatts. Actually, when you get the difference between the work of the turbine and the work of the compressor and the difference between the heat added and heat rejected they are actually equal so it means that the area of the PB diagram and the area of the TS diagram are also equal and to the last part of our discussion for today to answer our trivia question which is about a thermodynamic cycle that has exactly the same processes as the Brayton cycle. The answer is an ideal Rankine cycle, which is also composed of two reversible adiabatic processes, which are the compression of the feed water with the pump and the expansion of the steam in the steam turbine, and two isobaric processes, which are the heat addition in the boiler and heat rejection in the steam condenser. However, unlike the Brayton cycle, which uses gas, Rankine cycle uses steam as a medium. And that ends my presentation. Hope to see you on my next video. God bless.